Okay, welcome everyone in uh, Exploring Christianity to this first uh, narrated PowerPoint that's meant to help complement uh, your reading for uh, next week. So we're doing Augustine's Confessions, and so in order to prep for that, I want to just give you a couple uh, background points of information. So in the next 10 minutes or so, here's what you can expect. A little bit of background information on Augustine, who's pictured there to the right. Uh, a little bit about his context, his historical context, his cultural context. Uh, a word or two about the distinctive, perhaps, dimensions of his Christianity, and then things you're going to want to look at uh, while reading um, Confessions. So, in terms of a little bit of background, um, Augustine was born in 354 uh, in a town called Thagast in North Africa, which is now um, Algeria, and it's depicted there in that uh, yellow circle. His mother was a Christian. Um, when he was born, his father was not. His father actually converted to Christianity on his deathbed. And some that say that that would be because Augustine's mother, Monica, St. Monica, was a very persuasive uh, Christian. In fact, she followed her son all over um, the Mediterranean to try to convince him to become a Christian. But um, before heading into Rome or heading to Europe, he lived... Um, he lived in uh, Thagas and then he lived in uh, Carthage for a little while because Augustine was a rhetorician. In other words, he was somebody who, um, as would have been the case for educated people in the, um, the fourth century, he was somebody who was very much persuaded by truth um, and felt that truth needed to be told persuasively. So he was someone who could talk a very, very good game and liked to engage in all sorts of dialogue about the intellectual and philosophical questions. Um, the other thing that's interesting about um, Augustine is that he was also um, a very well-educated man and he was a scholar and he was very intrigued by all of the different schools of philosophical thought that had been roaming around or in the air there in the North Africa. And so he was a very intellectual person. And he really liked to talk. He really liked to be persuasive and elegant um, with his speech. And he was very compelled by people who were also uh, elegant in their speech. He was also a teacher and so around um, uh, the time he was 15 or 16, he left to move, he left uh, home and went to Carthage, another city there in North Africa where he was a teacher. And it was also in Carthage that he met a woman who uh, he cared for very deeply um, and who we would probably call his, his common law wife or we would call his, his partner today. Uh, but because of differences in their educational background and also more importantly differences in their social class, he never married her. But he lived with this woman um, from the time he was 17 for about 15 years. And they actually had a son together uh, when he was in Carthage. But again, they were not able to marry um, because marriage was really seen as an economic arrangement and there was nothing uh, that she could have brought to that arrangement. Um, I think another thing that would be important to point out then, um, in addition to Augustine being a, um, a father and a partner, um, is that he was someone who really um, was in some ways a migrant worker uh, in that he was constantly looking for new teaching opportunities, constantly looking for new schools of thought. And so he did um, head to Rome um, after living in Carthage for a while and left his um, his common-law wife, or what have been called a concubine, back in Carthage. And he went to Rome for a little while and found the teaching there a little bit unsatisfying, a little bit challenging, and then landed in Milan, um, north of Rome. And so it was in Milan, actually, that he encountered St. Jerome. Jerome was the bishop of uh of Milan and was a very persuasive preacher. And uh, Augustine recalls that it was really in hearing Jerome preach that he heard for the first time very persuasive arguments about Christianity. He heard Christianity engage in some ways with lots of the philosophical conversations with which he was familiar, but it was also the first time that someone was articulating Christianity 
to him in a way that was persuasive, with a kind of rhetoric that he found elegant, in a way that perhaps truth be could become revealed to him. So you see there uh, in that picture, you've got a young Augustine sort of in the trappings, both of a Roman citizen, but then also dressed as a kind of a philosopher. Um, and then there's Saint Jerome. Um, it was not a very quick and easy process. In fact, as you're going to read in Confessions, it was a rather, rather torturous process for him to convert, but he did eventually convert um, in 387. And then shortly after that, in three, uh, three or four years later, he returns to um, North Africa to become the bishop of the city of Hippo. And it was really then that he becomes recognized as a father of the church. And um, that distinction means that he was a great thinker. And he was somebody who wrote many sermons, many letters, many treatises, um, and really sort of built um, up the intellectual life of the church much as he had done um, as somebody who was engaged in philosophy. And I think that idea of him being an intellectual contributor to the church is recognized there in that book. And he wrote on marriage, he, he wrote on sexuality, he wrote on politics, he wrote on war. He's a very prol prolific thinker. So let's talk a little bit about um, his historical context. It's important to note that Augustine's life was really bookended by two very important things that were going on in the Roman Empire. Just about 40 years before he was born, um, the Edict of Milan was passed. Remember we said that that was when Constantine made Christianity the religion of the empire. So Christianity was still very much in a time of flux, having gone from being a countercultural sideshow uh, to being the main event in many ways in terms of religion in the empire. But also, um, 20 years before he dies, Rome is attacked for the first time. And so it's really a very um, precarious time in Rome because it's the, it's the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. The second thing is that he lived in a very stratified society. So I mentioned earlier that he was not able to marry um, the woman that he loved because she was of a different class. So Roman and Christian society was very stratified according to class. It would have been very stratified gratified according to gender. And so you might pick up on some of these things um, as you read. Also, it would be important to note that uh, there was a rich uh, philosophical climate in the Roman Empire at the time of Augustine. And um, he was very himself very influenced by Neoplatonist philosophers. So philosophers who were re-examining and bringing forward some of the ancient ideas of Plato. Um, and one of those big thinkers was Plotinus. And Augustine is very, very influenced in Plotinus. And Plotinus was somebody who really saw the world in very black and white ways, black and white in terms of good and bad, had a very dualistic framework. Um, and so really saw that life was really a, um, a struggle between the powers of good and the powers of evil and was somebody who thought that people would be best not the best the ideal life was for people who were not able who or rather who were able to kind of transcend uh, attachments to the material world and be very engaged in the search for truth that would have taken them away from the material world, away from their physical bodies and had them look at higher purposes or higher ideas. And some of you might be uh, familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave and that's what Plotinus was also thinking about. But there were also would have been um, other religions at the time, and a big religion um, in the Roman Empire at the time, which was also a bit of a philosophy, was Manichaeism. You can see a depiction there of Mani, the philosopher and figure Mani. And Manichaeists were also people um, who saw the world divided in these very black and white or good or bad or um, hierarchical ways. And Manichaeism was a very big philosophy which um, in some ways, Augustine was very attracted to as a young man and wrestles with with most of his life, mostly because of this sense of wanting to seek higher goods, wanting to seek higher purposes. Um, and then finally, um, around the time Augustine becomes a Christian, this is a time when the church's tradition, the post-Jesus or excuse me, post-Easter Jesus tradition would be about three centuries old at this point. There's a lot of different stories about Jesus, a lot of different interpretations of his life, a lot of different meanings that were applied to the significance of the person and God of Jesus. And 
this is a time in the church where it was trying to streamline these differences, weed out things that seemed to be strange or things that seemed not to fit um, things that would later be called heresies. And so this is an image here um, of Augustine engaging some of the big thinkers, other Christian thinkers, who throughout history have kind of been named as heretics because of their interpretation or what Augustine would have considered their misinterpretation of um, of the Bible or of the significance of Jesus or of the importance of the church. So he was somebody who was very in, um, intellectually engaged with people who did not agree with him. Let me give you a couple really quick things about his Christianity that you're going to want to keep in mind. So again, the influence of the philosophical climate of his day shapes his thought. He's a very dualistic thinker. So as you look through um, Con confessions, you're going to see him wrestling with dualisms, um, pairings um, that seem to be in conflict with each other. So that might be between good and evil, between the body and the mind, between pleasure and truth, between being sinful and being perfect. Augustine is very much like Plato in that he sees the world in these pairings, in this kind of dualistic way. Um, a second thing that we could point out is that um, in some ways, Confessions is a very a long prayer. It is a memoir because it is a reflective piece. Um, he wrote it about 13 to 15 years after he converted, so he's had some time as a Christian to look back at the way God had been working in his life, perhaps in ways that he wasn't even aware of. And so um, he's one who's going to name God as being something uh, that works in his life through other people. And that is going to be a word that we're going to come back and unpack a little bit, and that's very significant in Christianity, and it's this notion of grace, the way in which God is present and works in or um, in and through our lives. So that'll be something to keep in mind. The other thing you might notice is that he is somebody who is a very emotional person. He loved very deeply. He was deeply suspicious of many things. He was a very passionate thinker. He gave um, his all to everything. Um, but he's not so sure if he can trust his emotions. And again, this is a reflection of the philosophical climate in which he was raised. Emotions were things that tied you to your body. Emotions were things that reminded you that you were limited. That emotions were things that kept you in the material world. Wouldn't it be better if we could just get away from our emotions, transcend our emotions, move beyond them? And yet at the same time, Augustine knows that emotion is what has connected him or made it possible for him to feel uh, the call of God, which in some ways is reflected there in that picture on the right that captures his conversion. I think you're also going to see he's an intellectual. He sees Christianity as both an intellectual and an emotional enterprise. He is deeply rational and also deeply spiritual. Um, and again, he's the father of the church who has written uh, volumes and volumes and volumes of things that continue to shape the way Christians think of the world. In fact, President Obama might be on the television right now talking about um, U.S. military response to ISIS and would probably be invoking some of Augustine's ideas about war, our just war theory and proportionate response to violence that comes directly from Augustine. So he was a very intellectual thinker. So I want you to be looking for a couple things here as you're um, reading reading confessions that are connected to what we've talked about. It'll be important to look and see if there's a particular paradigm of faith that Augustine's working with. Also, he might reference scripture from time to time. Do you get a sense of how he's interpreting scripture? Is he doing that historically, metaphorically, or sacramentally? Um, does he reflect in any way a model of faith that we've talked about so far this semester? A census, fidelitas, fiducio, excuse me, fiducia, visio, again, what way might he be uh, reflecting some of Borg's ideas? And then finally, what notion of God seems to be operative here? Is Augustine talking about mystery? Is he somebody who's really approaching God as a problem perhaps to be solved, which would have been the case for many of the philosophers with whom he was constantly engaged? What kind of theism does he rely on? So these are some of the questions to be thinking about as you read Confessions. I'll post uh, the page numbers uh, for you to consider. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on Tuesday.